Yeah. Okay, so if you're really pushing to advance your career in programming, mm. you inevitably run into probably the biggest professional hurdle there is. Mm. Concurrency. Yeah. I mean, moving beyond that simple sequential logic, mm. having multiple things happening at once, it's just essential in modern systems. Absolutely essential. But uh, it creates this profound challenge, right? How do you actually manage shared data yeah. without, well, corruption, chaos, or the whole thing just falling over? Mm. Stability is key. So today we're doing a deep dive into two uh, fundamentally opposing ways to answer that question. Yeah. We've got C++ with its really powerful shared state model on one side. Right, a control model. And then on the other side, there's Erlang's pretty radical share-nothing philosophy. Mm. Our whole mission here is to dissect these two philosophies and you know show you why understanding this choice is so critical for figuring out what kind of high-value systems you're actually equipped to build in your career. And this isn't just like comparing language features. It's really a philosophical fork in the road. C++ operates by giving you these powerful, very low-level tools so you can manually manage all that complexity. You get total control. Total control, but that control demands, well, perfection, basically. Erlang, on the other hand, it's built entirely on the actor model. It's designed specifically to avoid shared state and therefore avoid a lot of that complexity right from the start. Okay. So we're going to unpack this huge trade-off it creates. C++ can give you incredible raw computational speed, mm -hmm. while Erlang delivers systemic resilience and uh, truly massive throughput, different kinds of fast. All right, let's start with C++. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the reigning champion of direct control, right? Mm -hmm. Its model is built on that shared state concept, using these uh, heavyweight operating system threads that are all digging into the same memory space. Yeah, the philosophy is just pure empowerment for the developer. You get this incredibly fine-grained authority over the threads themselves and over the memory. So the analogy people often use, it's like a bunch of collaborators, right? Mm -hmm. Your threads, mm -hmm. all working like crazy on one mm -hmm. single giant whiteboard that's your shared memory. Exactly. And to stop that whiteboard just becoming an illegible mess, well, you need some rules. You need a talking stick. That's your mutex, your lock. And uh-oh, if you forget to grab that stick, or maybe the order gets mixed up, that's when you hit the core danger of shared state. The race condition. Precisely. Yeah, yeah. A race condition happens when the final result depends entirely on the, well, non-deterministic timing of when things run. Think about the simplest possible operation, incrementing a counter, just plus plus counter. Looks like one step. Looks yeah. like one step. But under the hood, at the machine level, it's actually three. Read the current value, modify it, add one, and then write the new value back. Okay. Now, if two threads both read the counter when it's, say, 100, both then calculate 101, and then both write 101 back. Hmm? You've just lost an update. Ah, uh, right, it should be 102. It should be 102, but it's 101. A critical update just vanished into thin air. These are those Heisen bugs. People talk about bugs that seem to change or disappear when you try to observe them because the timing changes. So the issue isn't just the sharing, it's that these fundamental operations, they aren't naturally atomic. We're forced to constantly use these external things like mutexes, to make them seem atomic. Better right. And if the threads aren't just fighting over the data, sometimes they fight over the locks themselves, which gets us to that infamous deadly embrace, the deadlock. Ah, oh, deadlocks, yeah, they're a system killer. Usually it's caused by inconsistent lock ordering. So imagine thread one grabs lock A, then it tries to grab lock B. Okay. But at the same time, thread two has already grabbed lock B, and now it's trying to grab lock A. <sighs> They're stuck. Completely stuck. Both blocked forever, each waiting for a resource the other one holds. That part of your application just grinds to a halt. Dead. It sounds terrifying. Yeah. Yet C++ developers obviously build concurrent systems. The language has innovated massively to make mm -hmm. this dangerous model. Well, survivable. It has, big time. Like moving away from just manually calling lock yeah. and unlock, that was super error prone, right? Especially with exceptions flying around. Oh, absolutely. Forgetting an unlock in an exception handler was a classic source of deadlocks or resource leaks that led to the widespread use of RAII. Resource acquisition is initialization. Which is fundamental C++ now. It's critical. Yeah. yeah. Anyone doing serious C++ needs to live and breathe RAII. These wrappers like std.lockguard or the more flexible std.uniquelock, they're essential. They use the object's constructor to acquire the lock right when you create it. Exactly. And the destructor, which is automatically called when the object goes out of scope, releases the lock. Ah, so it guarantees cleanup. Guarantees it. Doesn't matter if the code finishes normally, returns early, or even throws an exception. 
When that lock guard object is destroyed as the stack unwinds, the lock is released. It standardizes resource management, cuts down human error dramatically. And even the deadlock problem itself saw some innovation. C++17 gave us STD.scopeLock. Right. ScopeLock is clever. You can give it multiple mutexes you need to acquire. Okay. And it uses a special deadlock avoidance algorithm internally to acquire all of them atomically without risking that deadly embrace scenario we talked about. So does that, does that kind of innovation fundamentally solve the shared state problem? Mm. Or is it just layering safety nets over something inherently dangerous? It's definitely layering safety nets, very useful ones. Scope lock fixes a major mechanism for deadlocks that inconsistent ordering, but the fundamental cognitive load, it's still enormous. Right. The source material makes a great point here. The difficulty in C++ concurrency isn't just like complexity A plus complexity B. It's not the sum of concurrency challenges and manual memory management challenges. It's the product. It's the product of their interaction. Think about it. If one thread frees some memory, while well, another thread is still holding a raw pointer to that same memory. Boom! You get a concurrency bug, maybe a crash, maybe subtle corruption, and its appearance depends purely on timing. Wow. So you have to be perfect on two incredibly difficult fronts simultaneously. I see. All the time. Okay. Hearing that, it sounds like C++ concurrency is basically just a constant test of human perfection. And uh, that realization probably drives other languages to just abandon shared state completely. Absolutely. And that brings us neatly to Erlang, which just rejects shared state entirely. It embraces this share nothing architecture built on something called the actor model. OK, so no more OF threads fighting over the same memory space. What's the abstraction we're using instead? We're dealing with actors or what the industry often calls processes in Erlang, though sometimes people use green threads conceptually. But crucially, these are not the heavyweight OS threads C++ uses. They're lighter. Incredibly light. Tiny, efficient, and managed entirely by the Erlang runtime system itself, the Beam virtual machine. The OS kernel isn't even involved in scheduling them directly. Because of this, a single ordinary machine can comfortably run hundreds of thousands, even millions, of these concurrent processes. Wow, okay. And the key is isolation. Isolation is the absolute cornerstone. Each Erlang process has its own completely isolated memory, its own private heap, its own private stack. One process physically cannot reach in and corrupt another process's memory space. It's impossible by design. So how do they talk to each other then if they can't share memory? Asynchronous message passing. That's the only way. A process sends a message, which is actually a copy of the data, not a reference to another process's unique ID. It's PID. Oh, copy. OK, that's important. Very important. The sender sends the copy and just continues immediately. It doesn't wait. The receiving process has a private mailbox, like an inbox. It checks its mailbox and consumes those messages one by one sequentially. Ah. So inside a single process, everything is sequential again. Exactly. Since a process only ever handles one message at a time from its own mailbox, there's no need for internal locks within the process's own data structures. Race conditions and lock-based deadlocks inside a process, eliminated by the fundamental design. That level of isolation it makes Erlang's famous philosophy possible, right? The let it crash idea, yeah. which sounds counterintuitive. It does sound weird at first, but it's not encouraging bad code. It's a deeply pragmatic approach to fault tolerance enabled by that isolation. Since a crash in one tiny process is completely contained, it can't bring down its neighbors or corrupt shared data because there is no shared data. Why try to defensively code against every conceivable error inside that process? Okay. So what happens when it crashes? You let the small, isolated process fail fast if something unexpected happens. But that failure isn't ignored. It's handled systemically. And that's the job of the supervision tree. This is the real heart of OTP, which is Erlang's standard application framework. Supervision tree. Think of it as an organizational chart. You have worker processes doing the actual application logic, and you have supervisor processes whose only job is to watch over their child processes, workers or other supervisors. Like a manager? Exactly like a manager. When a worker process crashes, it sends an exit signal up to its supervisor. The supervisor catches this signal, looks at its pre-configured restart strategy. Common ones are like one for own, just restart the crashed one, or one for all, restart all siblings too. And then it restarts the failed component or components back to a clean known initial state. 
automatically. Ah, so you're moving error handling out of the messy business logic. Precisely. You move it away from tons of defensive try-catch blocks scattered everywhere, which might mask the real problem or leave things in a weird, inconsistent state. And you make it an architectural pattern, a systemic response. Yes. It's basically fighting entropy, the natural tendency towards disorder with system design, rather than relying on every single line of code being perfectly defensive. The contract is just incredibly sharp. C++ forces you, the programmer, to spend all your time trying to prevent errors. Erlang seems to focus your effort on architecting the system to deal with failure gracefully when it inevitably happens. That's a great way to put it. What's fascinating, though, is that Erlang doesn't, like, magically eliminate all bugs, does it? It just trades one class of bugs for another. Exactly right. You don't get those nightmarish, timing-dependent, shared-state Heisen bugs, but you trade them for bugs that are generally uh, much easier to reason about, logical flaws. Like what? Well, you can still have a message-based deadlock. Imagine process A sends a message to process B and waits for a reply, but process B has sent a message to process A and is also waiting for a reply. They're waiting for each other. Ah, a different kind of deadlock. A logical one. A logical deadlock in the communication protocol, yeah. Or you might get mailbox overflow. One process sends messages way, way faster than the receiver can possibly process them, and its mailbox queue grows without bound. Okay, but these sound debuggable. Generally, yes because there are logical errors in how your processes are interacting, not weird timing issues caused by memory contention. You can usually trace the message flow, look at the code logic, and figure out where the protocol went wrong. Much simpler, usually, than chasing race conditions. Okay, this leads us right to the absolute critical trade-off, the one that should really guide your career thinking, speed versus systemic throughput. We need to get past just raw theoretical performance numbers. What kind of performance actually delivers the most professional value? Well, for raw CPU bound tasks, pure number crunching, intense calculations within a single thread, C++ is almost always the clear winner. Where you need ultra low latency for that one calculation, it's faster at the calculation itself. Right. When the challenge is managing, say, millions of simultaneous network connections, coordinating massive amounts of I.O., handling tons of concurrent events, that's where Erlang often pulls ahead. Not in raw calculation speed, but in overall concurrent throughput. It's faster at the coordination and scale. And we actually have some pretty compelling quantitative proof of this, don't we? That Motorola study is kind of legendary. It really is a foundational piece of evidence. They took a complex telecom application originally built in C++ using Corba, a complex distributed object system, and they re-implemented the whole thing in Erlang. And the results? The Erlang version was up to three times faster in terms of actual transaction throughput, handling more calls, more operations per second. Three times faster throughput. Wow. And what about the code itself? Even more striking, maybe. The Erlang code base was less than one third the size of the C++ original. One third the size. Think about what that means for developer productivity, maintenance, bugs. And here's the kicker, the part that really shows the philosophical difference. <clears throat> Under heavy load, the C++ version eventually failed catastrophically, just fell over, system wiped out, and the Erlang version. The Erlang version, because of that process isolation and the supervision trees kicking in, it showed graceful degradation. It slowed down under extreme load, sure, but it kept running. It recovered automatically when the load decreased. The system never collapsed entirely. It maintained core functionality. That's the resilience you're buying with the actor model and let it crash. Okay, that's incredibly compelling. Uh so let's try to map these different philosophies and strengths onto actual career domains. Which architectural hero fits which kind of job? Where should you focus your learning? Right. It's about choosing the right tool or maybe the right hero for the specific job based on the primary challenge you're facing in that domain. So C++ 6, where does its strength in raw speed and control really shine? If you find yourself fighting what people call the nanosecond war, C++ is basically non-negotiable. This is where you absolutely need that bare metal control, and the complexity is just a necessary cost you have to pay for that ultimate speed. Think high-frequency trading HFT. Microseconds matter. Microseconds, even nanoseconds. They need ultra-low latency. They need to avoid any potential pause from things like garbage collection. They're often pinning specific threads to specific CPU cores for predictable performance. That's C++ territory. And the other big one is game development, right? AAA games. Absolutely. The core engines think 
Unreal Engine, CryEngine, they're built in C++ stand. They need that raw power to manage this massive, complex, shared memory representation of the game world for real-time physics simulation, rendering millions of polygons. It all has to be incredibly fast and responsive. Shared state is almost essential there. Okay, so that's the speed and control domain. You know, Erlang's battleground, the scale and resilience war. Exactly. This is all about managing just vast numbers of asynchronous, independent events, things happening concurrently, often unreliably. Telecommunications is its birthplace, right? Ericsson designed it specifically to build telephone switches that never went down. And the modern poster child. WhatsApp. It's the classic example. Handling billions of messages every single day, connecting billions of users, famously with a relatively small engineering team. How? They rely entirely on Erlang's one process per user connection model that gives them incredible scale and fault tolerance. If one user's connection process has an issue, it doesn't affect anyone else. That model sounds perfect for the Internet of Things too, IoT platforms. Perfect fit. Managing potentially millions of distributed devices, sensors, controllers, which are often connecting over unreliable networks. Erlang's lightweight processes and built-in fault tolerance are ideal for that one process per device pattern. And distributed databases. Yeah, several well-known ones like CouchDB and React are built on Erlang. They leverage its built-in distribution features, how easily processes can run across multiple machines, and its inherent fault tolerance to create databases that are highly available and partition tolerant. But it doesn't have to be strictly one or the other, does it? Yeah. You mentioned experts knowing when to use which. Is there a middle ground? Ah, uh, yes. The truly high-level approach often involves leveraging the best of both worlds, and that's where NIFs come in natively implemented functions. NIFs. Okay, sounds like the perfect bridge. What exactly does a NIF do? Why is it so effective? A NIF allows your Erlang code to safely and efficiently call functions that have been written in C or C++ A. So you build the main structure of your system in Erlang. The resilient nervous system. Exactly. Erlang manages the overall architecture, the massive concurrency, the distribution, the fault tolerance, the supervision, all the coordination stuff it excels at. But then for specific computationally intensive hotspots, maybe some really complex mathematical calculations, heavy duty cryptography, or performance critical network packet processing, you write that small piece in C++ for maximum raw speed. And call it from Erlang. And call it safely from Erlang as a NIFIF. So you get the highly performant muscle fibers from C++A embedded within the resilient Erlang skeleton and nervous system. It lets you achieve both that ultimate targeted speed and the overall system resilience and scalability. Best of both worlds. This whole deep dive really makes it clear. The conversation isn't about which language is just objectively better. It's about which philosophy is the better match for the specific problem your system is trying to solve. Mm -hmm. C++ offers you that ultimate control, leading to ultimate single-threaded performance. Mm -hmm. But it comes at this potentially exponential cost of managing complexity and needing frankly, near human perfection to avoid disaster. Right. And Erlang offers you default resilience, built-in systemic scalability, and really high concurrent throughput. You trade some of that raw single core computational speed, but you gain a system that's inherently self-healing, much more productive to develop for in its domain, and designed to handle failures gracefully. So the true mark of an expert programmer then, it isn't really about blind allegiance to just one tool, is it? Not at all. It's the wisdom to accurately analyze the required properties of the system you need to build. What are you really fighting against? Is your primary adversary time latency? Or is it complexity, scale, and just the relentless creep of entropy and failure over time? So as you, the listener, are planning your next big professional step, or maybe designing your next major project, mm -hmm. you really have to ask yourself that question. What's the main enemy? Latency? or complexity. And it's worth remembering, Erlang's domain, these huge fault tolerant backend systems, they often operate silently, invisibly. They're the unsung heroes precisely because reliability doesn't make headlines. You only notice when the other ones fail. Exactly. It only draws attention when its shared state counterparts have those spectacular failures we sometimes see. So. Since building those resilient, scalable systems is where so many high-value, interesting career opportunities lie, maybe consider where the future of coordination and fault tolerance is really heading. Which of these two powerful, crucial philosophies are you going to commit to mastering next? 